Hello and welcome to the Byzantine SCOTUS. This video is going to be taking a step back, and rather than making a video in either of my two main series, it's going to look at God's overall plan in history, and how I hope to show that both through the series on SCOTUS metaphysics and the series on scripture. In order to explain God's plan in history, we have to look at why there is something rather than nothing. When we understand why God exists, it illuminates his plan within creation. And the reason that God exists, there's many arguments for God's existence, but the one that Scotus lays out as the strongest is Anselm's ontological argument, that if we think about the nature of perfection, and specifically the pure perfections, things that aren't limited by matter, so for example, being a good runner is limited by matter, um, but something like wisdom or goodness or justice, these can exist infinitely. And so all of them, by their nature, if we think about it, of course, you'd have to make a more detailed argument as I have elsewhere. But if you think about them, they must exist necessarily in an infinite mode. And then if we think about these perfections, we begin to have an understanding of the Trinity. So unlike the existence of God, which can be proven by reason, the existence of the Trinity can't be proven by reason. But we can see that it is fitting according to what God is. If we think about the perfection of wisdom, that God is the ultimate thinker, God contemplates himself, and in doing so, creates an image of himself, the Logos, which reflects the divine attributes in God's will to create. And then his perfection of love, the Father sees his image in the Son, and eternally loves the Son, and so from bo both then the Father and the Son, or really the Father towards the Son, breathes forth the Spirit as a manifestation of this infinite love. And whereas our thoughts and our love are finite, and so they don't bring forth a whole new hypostasis, uh, God's thinking and God's love are infinite and directed towards an infinite end because they're directed towards himself. And so they each bring forth an entire hypostasis, an infinite hypostasis. And from this doctrine of the Trinity, then, we can reflect upon why God creates the world. The Father eternally loves the Son, and so he wills to create a reflection of the Son. And when we talk about the Logi, uh, we're not simply talking about all the possible creatures that God could have created, but what God does actually will to create. So within the Son are all the divine ideas, but specifically the Logi that God then reflects in the world so that the entire world is an image of the Son. And it's in the world through his vestiges, the Logi. And the finite Logi are contained within the infinite Logos. Um, because the finite is pre-exists within the infinite, not as a part, but as that it, in some finite way, represents the infinite as a sign pointing to it. And then the sun is specifically reflected in man through the image of God, of memory, intellect, and will. That man, by, a nature, by the nature of rationality, has memory. Memory brings forth intellect to analyze the contents of the memory and create universals from that. And then the intellect analyzing the memory brings forth the will, that the intellect presents to the will what it knows, and from this, the will makes decisions. And ultimately, God's plan then in creation is to unite it back to himself through the incarnation and the, ch and the church as his body. And this is God's purpose within all of creation. God's plan is glorification because the entire world is created for the sake of the Son. Then the incarnation is the final end of all things. And so even if there was no sin, there still would have been the incarnation. And so as I just said a second ago, the finite is contained more fully within the infinite. So within the disjunctive transcendentals, we can have this concept in our mind of being, and being is simply that which is not repugnant to, to be. 
that it's simply that which is. And so it's not something that we can speak of as actually existing on its own, but it's a concept we can hold in our mind. And it exists in God in the mode of being infinite and uncaused, and it exists in things as finite and caused. And the connection here ultimately is the logi, that these are reflected across um, this boundary here. And this is why Scotus's concept of univocity is extremely important. It's not a denial of analogy. Rather, what we're saying has to undergird analogy is a common concept shared by the two things. So, for example, uh, when St. Thomas in the Summa is talking about analogy, he brings up the example of healthy, that we can speak of medicine as healthy, an animal as healthy, and urine as healthy. A medicine is healthy in that it is the cause of health. Uh, an animal is healthy in that health is contained within the animal itself. And then health is within the urine as a sign when it's tested and we see then that the animal is healthy. But all three of these contain an underlying common concept of health of the animal that's related to each of these three things in three different modes. And so this is what's meant by univocity that uh, we have a common concept that's reflected in multiple ways. And when we're speaking of man compared to God, the common concept is this concept of being. But then we're, when we're thinking of different things related to one another, the, each logi serves as a common concept between them, right? That if two things have a common logos, that we can know that they have the same underlying concept, which is reflected in each one in a different mode. And when things are created by God, they're created in this seed form, the seminal reasons, or ratione seminalis, which develop throughout history. As God works the, through the world, he develops the world from this seed form into its full form that he intended um, from its very beginning, and that God created the world to mature into glorification. And God's plan it, to do this is through man who is in the image of God and after his likeness. That man has rationality, and so he is in the image of God. And man also is the boundary between heaven and earth. That man has rationality like God and the angels, but also has materiality like the world. And this is created ultimately for the incarnation then, which is the end of all things. And in the incarnation, you have the divine nature and the human nature come together in one person. And this is the ultimate union of heaven and earth, of which man is a foreshadowing. But man is also created after the likeness of God, which means to do what God does. Man's job is to mature the world into glorification by taking the world up and bringing it into this uh, glorified state. This is most especially seen in the Eucharist, where man takes uh, the, the physical elements of the world, bread and wine, and he offers them up to God, and God transforms them into his own divine life. And through man's work of bringing the world up into glorification, man himself matures into glorification. The way in which we mature is through service towards others, because within the Trinity, the divine life is one of charity, of service towards others, that the Father does not seek his own glory, but seeks the glory of the Son and the Spirit. And the Son does not seek his own glory, but the glory of the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit does not seek his own glory, but the glory of the Father and the Son. But God did not only create man, but he created a whole divine council of different ranks of angels. And the angels were created within a full maturity. The angels are already within the beatific vision. And so they only have one choice towards God or away from God. Now, angels can change, but they can't ever change this final decision because they've already received the greatest knowledge possible. And so their choice towards or away from God is the most possible free choice. Those who've chosen to move away from God did so in such a free way that nothing would ever be able to convince them. And the angels then, they're created to serve us. So they're often teachers for us, revealing divine revelation, 
Uh, they're guardians for us. Uh, they're certain angels that move the physical for forces of the universe. This is the entire purpose for which angels exist. Um, and even though man is not yet on the divine council, or at least most humans aren't, man will mature over time onto the council. And this is what we see in the new covenant. The saints now are on the divine council, and so we can invoke the saints to pray for us because they're up there even above the angels um, interceding towards God because they matured up to that spot. And while the angels already start there, since man matures up to that spot and man has had divinity communicated to him by having his nature within the hypostatic union, that man has now been brought above the angels. This is why the psalmist says that we were made a little lower than the angels, but we were crowned with glory and honor. And St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that you will judge angels because we are placed above the angels ultimately when we become saints? And so while we can have all this nice metaphysics of uh, how the universe works, how God is, ultimately, since we exist within a linear world that we are to mature throughout. History is extremely important because history is our movement towards God or away from God if we resist God um, over the course of our maturity. And scripture reveals an important part of that history, that first part of that history towards God. And so it's extremely important to study history if we want to understand God's purpose within it. And so we have man within the garden, but man moves away from God. And death is a separation, um, ultimately, that at death, we separate um, our body and our soul. And in the fall, we separate away from God. And in death, we separate away from God. Death is primarily about separation. And death, then, is a perversion of charity that in charity, right, we offer ourselves up fully to the other person. We seek the good of the other for their own sake and humble ourselves as much as possible. And then ultimately we are raised up in the other person communicating charity back towards us, just as the father loves the son in the spirit. And likewise, the spirit loves God the Son loves the Father in the Spirit, and so there's this communication of love back and forth between the three persons of the Trinity. But within death, we love ourselves for our own sake through sin, and so we're separated from God. We are humbled, but ultimately humbled unto death. He who humbles himself will be exalted, and he who exalts himself will be humbled. We also see within the fall, the fall of the whole creation, that Adam is the mediator between heaven and earth. That's the role of man, is man is the combination of heaven and earth. And so when Adam falls, the whole creation falls within Adam. And so the animals begin to die, the creation itself begins to become corrupted, and we see all these natural disasters within the world. These are all the result of Adam's fall. But man goes on to sin even further, and we see all throughout the first 11 chapters of Genesis, man getting more and more wicked. And so ultimately at the Tower of Babel, God divides up the nations across the world, and he places them under their own gods, these demons. Um, we see in Deuteronomy, Moses says that the nations were divided according to the number of the sons of God. That We see throughout the Old Testament then, all these nations of the world will worship these false gods that they've been placed under. But God wants to redeem this situation. And so God calls one family to redeem the world. And he takes this one family, which is, becomes a new Adam, and he places them within the land as a priestly nation. They're placed into a new garden. And they're meant then to communicate divine grace to the entire world. And to some extent, they do this. But the ultimate problem is that the law could not communicate divinity to humanity. All the law could do was keep sin at bay to some degree. And so, since they did not have 
uh, divine grace because divinity hadn't been communicated to humanity. They failed to keep the law. And we see at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses discusses the blessings and curses of the covenant. And he says, if you keep the law, you're going to be blessed and you're going to prosper in the land. You're going to convert the nations. But if you fail to keep the law, you're going to be sent into exile. And I know you're not going to keep the law because your hearts have not yet been circumcised. So you will be sent into exile. But a new Moses will come, a greater Moses, who will bring you back from this exile. And so since they fail to keep the law, they invoke the curse of the law, which is exile. This is what when St. Paul talks about the curse of the law, he's not saying that the law itself is a curse, but the curse which is within the law, the curse of exile for failing to keep the law. Additionally, the main purpose of the people of Israel was to evangelize the nations, but they failed to do this. Instead, Israel sees their calling as a chance for self-righteousness to claim how they're superior to all the other nations, and they shy away from evangelizing. And ultimately, they then use, especially in the New Testament era, um, this emphasis on key, on being faithful to God as a way to actually not be faithful to God and to boast in God. Um, but even though there is a failure on most of the people of Israel, there is a righteous remnant to redeem the world, and God will concentrate this down ultimately to a singular holy seed. This is talked about a lot in the prophets, the singular holy seed, and this one holy seed will redeem the world. And we see this concentrated especially on the Blessed Virgin Mary, as Mary represents the whole Old Covenant. She is the culmination of the people of Israel and the righteous remnant concentrated onto her and then she is the mother of all the living she is the um the symbol of the whole church as we see in the book of revelation and so mary is this boundary along with christ not through herself but through her participation in christ in her placement within history and so before i move on to discussing the incarnation itself i first want to look at the primary exegetical method that the New Testament uses for the Old Testament and give the metaphysics of it. Because typology isn't merely a method of exegesis, but is really an underlying metaphysics. That all of history is related typologically, and that includes within the New Covenant, that events within church history can be related to each other through typology, and events within our own life can be related to each other through typology. That history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And the way that typology works is that historical events have a common point of reference, that the two events are similar because they share a similarity which they both point towards. And so typology is a sort of analogy where the two things aren't the same, but that they have an underlying similarity. But we have to remember then that that common point of reference is itself univocal. So we're not denying, denying a univocity here, but we're seeing that the univocity exists within a larger analogy. And then the common point of reference is Christ, because the logi of all things include historical events, different types without throughout history. They are logi that reflect back to the one logos. And therefore, the incarnation is the central event in history, in which all these different types that occur both before and after the incarnation find their reference to. That this is why we can speak of all di these different types as types of Christ, or types of things closely related to Christ, especially Mary and the Church, because Mary and the Church are decreed along with the absolute primacy of Christ. In um, in Ephibolis Deus, which is the decree dog uh, dogmatizing the Immaculate Conception, it says that Mary was decreed by one in the same decree with Christ. And this is not merely an obscure point uh, that happened to get listed in there, but is really a defense not only of the Immaculate Conception, but the Scotist understanding of the Immaculate Conception, that Mary was conceived 
was decreed to be conceived immaculately, even apart from sin, that even if there was no sin, she still would have been most holy. But given that there is sin, part of being most holy is that she must then be preserved even from original sin. All right, so now I'm going to go on from here to discussing the Incarnation. And so, in the Incarnation, um, which is how God saves us, Christ communicates the divine activity to every human activity. We see within Isaiah 59 that no man was able to bring righteousness, so God himself puts on righteousness as a breastplate. And so, God himself becomes man. And God lives every single human activity as a human. So he goes and he goes to a wedding. He works a job. He even grows up as a child. In all these different little activities he does, he communicates divinity to that human activity. And so every time now we do that human activity, we're united to that time Christ did that same activity and we participate within his divinity. But he doesn't merely take all the actions of our life, but he goes all the way into death, and he communicates the divine activity into death, um, and thereby he resurrects human nature himself, itself, right? Because he goes down into death, but he has infinite life, and so in his infinity, it ultimately destroys death and brings life to all of human nature, and so, even before the resurrection comes now, the righteous are sitting on the divine council because they've been raised up with Christ. And at the end of time, every human will be resurrected because every human has been united to the divine activity. But the damned will experience a second death of eternal opposition to God. Remember, death is separation. And so the damned will eternally that they be separated from God. And the way Christ does this, remember there was the curse of exile, the curse of death that Adam suffered. And so Christ comes as the new Adam and as the new Israel, and he takes on the curse of exile onto himself and brings us back from exile by becoming the new Adam, the new Moses, and the new Israel. As it says in Deuteronomy, cursed is every man who hangs upon a tree. And as St. Paul comments on this, he then became the curse for us, that the curse of the law, which was exile for failing to keep the law, was placed on the man who hangs on the tree. And so then Christ ascends up into heaven, and he kicks the, the demons out of the divine council, those who disobeyed God. And... He then raises up the saints with him in his ascension to sit on the divine council. He then sends forth the Spirit to continue his mission into the world, and he commissions the church to call the nations back to him. Since the demons have now been kicked out of the divine council, they can no longer rule over all the nations. The nations can no longer be deceived, and so Christ will now go out to all the nations through the church, and the church will evangelize all the nations. The new covenant isn't national like the old covenant was because the new covenant has the ability to actually reach all the nations because the false gods have been defeated. But Christ not only redeems man, but he redeems the entire creation. Because in Adam, the entire creation fell. And we have to think about the fact that the entire creation is a reflection of the one Logos. And the one Logos becomes united to creation in the Incarnation. And so the entire creation, which reflects the one Logos, becomes united to its archetype. And so the entire creation then is divinized, and the church's job is partly to bring out the, the outworking of this divinization through its work. And as I said earlier, this is most especially in the Eucharist, where we take the physical elements of this world and actually transform them into the divine essence itself. And so after all of this work, 
is accomplished, that's when Christ will return. As the psalmist says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That the church has to go out there and actually evangelize all the nations and bring the entire world up into the divine life as much as is possible in throughout history, that is when Christ will return. That It's not until the enemies are made a footstool that uh, Christ will return. And so this means our outlook on history should be optimistic, that we know we will win in the end. So there's no need to win in this moment, even if things might look bad at one particular time in history. That doesn't mean we have to assume that things are bad in the long run, because in the long run, things will ultimately be good, because things will ultimately... Um, Things will ultimately work out in our favor because Christ has already won. And so this means also that Christianity is political, that the submission of all nations to the church is our political goal because we are defeating all of Christ's enemies and submitting them to him. And that includes wicked governments that are submitted to him. And I think this is why the Pope needs to have a temporal authority, because through the submission of the nations to the Vicar of Christ, Christ comes to rule over those nations. But again, that doesn't have to be achieved in a few years from now. You know, it could take hundreds of years to achieve, but ultimately we will achieve it in some point in the future. And we should finally remember that the age to come is material and not Gnostic, that all of creation is glorified and we're going to live in this newly glorified creation. And so we should remember that the perfection um, of us is within our will and not the intellect. At least within Scotism, this is what it really emphasizes, because when we live within this new creation, we're going to live in a perfect communion of charity of all persons and the entire creation. And so the entire creation will have this perfect divinity and charity throughout it. And so ultimately it is then in the perfection of our will, our love towards others, that we are perfected in how the age to come will be. It's not simply going to be a beholding of God, but an actual living of communion with God. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know this video was very rushed, but I was hoping to create something that would give a good people a good introduction to the direction I'm going with this channel. And I was trying to make it as quick as possible to just get all these ideas across. So if you're a little confused, just watch some of my other videos or watch this again. And I think things will um, settle into your mind pretty quickly. I also apologize for the number of gaps within this video. I'm recovering from a cold right now, so I had to stop and catch my breath a number of times recording this video. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, uh, hit the bell icon, comment below, uh, share this to your friends please if you enjoyed it. I'm trying to get to enough uh, subscribers where I can monetize this channel because if I can get some ad revenue that will really help me place this YouTube channel as an important priority within my life. Uh, also, if you're enjoying these videos and you would like early access or exclusive content, subscribe to me on Patreon. By the time this is up, I will hopefully have the first exclusive interview up. And thank you.